Cool. Thanks a lot. So I'm Thomas Graf. Uh, I'm a distinguished network engineer and a network analytics architect at Swisscom. And today uh, with Marco, maybe Marco, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Marco Tollini. Um, I am data engineer at Swisscom and I did my master and I was seated where you are basically two years ago. Right, so uh, today um, um, we, we are giving you some, some insights what we are at Swisscom doing with network analytics, also a bit about the importance of uh, data mesh and give you some uh, news, some updates, uh, what's currently the, the network telemetry development at ITF, the, the standardization body of the internet. These pictures you probably know from the media and if you're following on the internet uh, around the world, uh, you see that more and more network operators uh, are uh, showing that they are having network outages. And what's interesting is that these network outages, the intensity, the impact, and also the duration slowly uh, increase, uh, increasing over time. And they're hinting that we have challenges here in the network visibilities. At Swisscom specifically, uh, thanks to, let's say, the smartphones here, usually the customer knows the service impact before. Uh, basically, the, we as an operator recognize that. So basically, what's the challenge is that uh, when changes are happening in the network, regardless if they are configurational or operational, uh, it's really hard to be faster than uh, our uh, subscribers, and therefore we suffer reputational damage. If we look at uh, ITF, there were basically the IPs, the IP connectivity is being standardized. We see that only about 10% of the, of the effort actually focusing on network automation and monitoring. And with, within this area, probably only 2 or 3% are focusing on, on monitoring. And therefore, in the industry, uh, we are still using very old protocols such as SNMP or CLI to actually monitor the network. And there are, uh, up, to the, up to now, just a very few exceptions such as IPFIX and BGP monitoring protocol where we have IP protocols which have built-in debug, debug uh, capabilities. So maybe Marco. It's also off, so oh, yeah. that doesn't help. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so um, let's start with a brief history of the team. We started in 2015, 2016, and the first uh, approach is, of course, the first need is to get data. So the first thing was to onboard new platform that you can see here. Then we immediately recognized that, uh, as Thomas was saying, only 2% of uh, ITF work is, uh, is um, about telemetry. So you know, uh, there, is, there is a lot of lack of it, there is a lot of problems, uh, no standardization at all. Every vendor has its own way of doing things, and that's not great if you want to collect from multiple vendors. So the next step was to go to ITF and start working with university and ITF itself to create new drafts and standards. Then um, after you have the data, enough data in strategic point of, of the network, what you can do is basically you can do change verification. So after a change, the network engineers can check that the change was successful and troubleshooting in case of problems, of course. And then from here, this is of course a manual step. So what you can do is anomaly detection. So basically you can simulate what the network engineer does automatically. Then from that SLO reporting, so you can, uh, based on the anomaly detection results, say when your uh, service was available and when not. And then finally, uh, well, uh, network being a network, you want to visualize it as a graph and not as tables. So network visualization uh, and uh, capacity management and trend detection. And there is basically, for example, your RAM uh, of a router is going up and up and up, and you want to have to be alerted before your router explodes. And now it's uh, 2022, and today we have around 400 Swisscom customers, uh, so internal Swisscom employees, and about 25 million metrics per second. And talking about data, that was another, um, you know, 
problem for us. Uh, the first generation is the proprietary. So you go to a vendor, to a company, and they provide the whole solution. And now it's easy to integrate with this kind of uh, um, solution. Then we said, and we were very smart, OK, all the data in one single place in our data lake. And that's the second generation. Then we said, mm, OK, batch is cool, but the real time is better. So we had Kappa. And now this is where we are today. And now we figure out that we have you know, tens of teams, thousands of, of data sources. We don't know anymore who is using what. There is no clear interface between uh, multiple uh, data sources. Uh, so it's, it's basically this magnificent data lake with all the data in. It's uh, kind of cumbersome to manage. So now where we are going is data mesh. And data mesh is basically, uh, we like networks. So we like to say that data mesh is like networks. So <laughs> we have uh, multiple domains. So the data is stored in domain, and a domain can be uh, anywhere in the company. So there is no more centralized data storage. And then there is a, a central government in the company that define uh, the interfaces between domains. So basically, it tells you the schema, how you can uh, interoperable, interoperable uh, work together. Uh, it's also true that we are, of course, a bit of a special case uh, because it's true that we have analytical data that we produce, so we can uh, work with the, with the central governance, but also we have operational data, and that comes directly from the network, and that is not decided by us how it should look like, but that's decided by ITF, which is the standardization body. So what we give our, uh, uh, well, our Swisscom employees today uh, at the bottom, you see that we collect the data. And with that, we produce basically uh, three streams. It's device topology, control plane, and forwarding plane information. And these three streams are also used by alerts and reports to create other three streams, which are SLO reporting, trend detection, and anomaly detection, which is where we focus today. And so with this six uh, view, the uh, employee can basically understand uh, what's happening and take uh, the right action. And the products are, uh, first, we want to troubleshoot. Then we want to automate the troubleshoot with anomaly detection. Then we want to visualize, uh, which uses the data from that we would use in verification and troubleshooting. Then there is capacity management, which is, again, basically uh, check if a router is exploding or not. And of course, you want to automatize that as well. So there is trend detection. And then there is finally a uh, service uh, level objective, so SLO, and a closed loop population, which would be basically our final goal, which is you do a change and you verify that the change is correct in an automatic fashion. And it is very important to model the data correctly. So here you see at the top, we, it's our intent. So we sell a Swisscom service, for example, internet 100 megabit. And now we need to configure the service into the network. And this is actually the reality. So you need to go to the uh, topology, so to the device, and configure the right interfaces. You need to go to the control plane and you know, uh, set up the right peerings. And finally, the traffic, the forwarding plane, can finally flow. And now, if you don't model the data, you start seeing drops. And you wonder, are these drops good or bad, right? Uh, maybe you say drops are always bad, but then I tell you, I sell you 100 megabit, and if you try to push 200, I drop because there is a shaper, so that's a good drop for us. And so this, this is why it's important to model the data correctly. Our pipeline, we start at the top left with the network device, so the router, sending data to a data collection. The data collection basically aggregates the data and ingests the data to a message broker for live processing. In our case, this is Kafka. At this point, the data can either go to a data processing pipeline. For example, in uh, device topology, we have counters. So the number of packets in an interface that go through an interface, that's a number that is always increasing. And uh, what you want to do, you want to normalize that number so that you can see the difference. Uh, and then, anyway, the data goes back to message broker and finally to a data store and to an analytics platform where you can uh, observe metrics. And finally, there is a human that, can, uh, that is informed uh, about all this data. Talking about uh, um, um, anomaly detection, let's say, um, the problem in our uh, 
uh, field is that we have different observations. So we said again, we have three streams, it's device, control, and flow. And they are not synchronized, they are not connected in any way. So basically, we have, let's say, a single link goes down, and now we have multiple events in device, control, and forwarding plane, um, and they are arriving at the different time at our collection. So what happens is that we basically cannot easily correlate these events, so we need to determine a way to do so. And uh, what we do is uh, we choose a customer, um, which here we define as VPN. Uh, you can think that it's uh, any customer using uh, uh, Swisscom. And we check for the BGP peering and the interface uses by, used by that customer. And then on an event, so for example, you start seeing BGP withdrawals and update, you start seeing traffic goes up and down, uh, you create a concern. And a concern is nothing else than a number from zero to one that tells you how, uh, how this event can impact your final service. And from that, you can basically create one single score. So from multiple observation score, you create one single. And finally, you unify multiple alerts in the same VPN uh, via an alert identifier. So let's, let's give an example of what we do. At the bottom, uh, you see basically uh, our network topology. It is six nodes, and you see that there are two lines, a blue one and an orange one. Those are two customers, two VPNs. The blue one is redundant, so it means that it has an alternative path to go from this node to this node, which is the two bottom routers. The orange one is not redundant. So if it loses one of those uh, two routers in between, it's, it's, it's done. So the first event that we make happen is that we shut down the interface in here for this router. Oh, sorry, for this router. So what happens is, of course, uh, from the image that the blue line will take the alternative path. And we see it here in the red line. And we have each, each of this part is a concern. So this is the concern for uh, BGP updates. And we see that the orange is not having any because there is no alternative path. So basically, uh, no updates. There are some BGP withdraw withdrawals for both VPNs because, again, we shut down appearing. So it, it's, the network is reconverging. There is, this is the uh, TCP traffic drops. And we see that blue line, very low, we drop maybe some packets you know, in the reconvergence for some millisecond, but not much. And the orange one on the other side is start to grow. So the concern is very high because we are dropping packets and we know. Then there is the concern for UDP packets, which is same as TCP. We are dropping packets only in one of the two. And finally, there is the um, concern for device telemetry. And uh, here you don't see it very well, but this is the, the line for blue and orange are one over the other because we shut the interface that is using both. Then, and, and as a result, sorry, this at the top is the overall score, concern score, and we see that the green line is our threshold. So we see that the orange is over our threshold, and it means that the most probably that is impacted. And indeed, it is impacted. We are dropping packets, right? And in the blue one, which is below the threshold, it means that, yeah, something is not very right. We should look into it, but there is no immediate impact. Then at the second time, the new uh, red line, we, know we shut down also the other interface, right? So orange is already down, so nothing will happen over there. But the blue one, we start to see the same as orange so before. So we start dropping packets. Uh, we see another interface go goes down, some BGP activities, and, and we say, ah, oh, OK, it's not good. And so we see an impact on that. So there is a customer impact. So we, we go above the threshold, and we start firing alarm and badges around. Cool. Thanks a lot, Marco. So we, we learned now in this session, basically, from, uh, from a network uh, engineering perspective, we need to basically monitor different aspects of the network, so the device, the control plane, and also the forwarding plane. And now I will give you some real-life example uh, from, from the past. And I'm starting again with the newspaper article. You, may, you might have seen that in 2020. 
important here, look at the dates. The first one is in February, while the second one is in June. And uh, what happened in those two uh, maintenance windows is basically a core transition at Swisscom. So basically all the big network operators are using MPLS to transfer, to to basically virtualize their networks. And now there is a transition going on towards segment routing. In a first step, it's so-called MPLS segment routing. So the, basically the data plane remains the same. The way how labels are being allocated are changing now. And with the last one, with the SRV6, we are actually moving away from the MPLS towards the IPv6 data plane. And in the uh, first maintenance window on February, our monitoring capabilities were actually focusing on the so-called provider edge routers, uh, where basically the, the, the VPNs are being terminated, but the maintenance window were focusing on the provider core routers. And in that maintenance window in February, there were a handful of network engineers performing the change in the network, and within uh, approximately five to seven minutes, we actually understood that the forwarding does not happen the way how it's supposed to be. These seven minutes were enough to actually trigger that most of the, uh, let's say, the traffic in Switzerland from residential to B2B to emergency services were not functioning anymore. And therefore, we ended up being on the newspaper and we ended up to go to the government and had to explain why this happened. Now, four months later, the same situation again. The big difference is that at that point in time, we are actually also covered from a monitoring aspect, the core itself. And what happened back then was basically uh, in the first maintenance window, there were just a half a uh, handful of network engineers present, while in the second uh, maintenance window, the let's say the there was much more pressure on the on the company that uh, we are performing well on that maintenance window and therefore not only network engineers were present but also there were uh, other let's say uh, engineers present who are actually are responsible for services in Swisscom for instance for VoIP services or TV services we had management present, and last but not least, we had also newspaper report, uh, reporters present. So before we had a handful of people, now we had about 50 or 60 people who were actually on site, and we're performing exactly the same maintenance window again. What's different to the past is while we were actually changing the network, uh, while the uh, basically the change was being propagated throughout the network, we were actually seeing why the packets are being dropped and where they're being dropped. Uh, so basically, we could give the, the, the drops so-called network dimensions. And with these dimensions, we were able to explain why these drops are being, uh, why these drops are uh, happening. And we were seeing that basically the, the network is converging and the drops were basically uh, going away. So within three to five minutes, we were able to establish the fact that the a change in the network actually worked the way how we are uh, we we wanted to, and we were actually super relaxed and said, "Okay, I think that's it. We are done for the today. All good." Then, about a few minutes later, the uh, persons who are responsible for the applications were reaching out to us and asking, "Hey, did you perform any change on the network? We didn't notice anything." And then the next thing what happened was that the management got involved and like, "Hey." What's happening? So did we really change the network? And the, now, the last thing was actually the newspaper reporters. They were very confused. What's actually going on right now? And that showed me in that moment in time, if you do not have the visibility, if you do not know uh, over these millions of, millions of data points you're collecting, if you don't have the overview over the network completely, you cannot have uh, a conclusive answer if the maintenance window performed well or not within a very short period of time. And this is necessary because the IP connectivity gets more and more important, so key, inter so major interruptions are not no, no more tolerated by the society. Incidents unfortunately happen uh, everywhere in the, around the world, and this is just an example uh, on um, end of 2021 on Facebook. 
uh, there um, basically we can see from a Swisscom perspective, if we are starting here at the bottom with the control plane, that uh, from, the, from the Facebook BGP ASN, changes of the network of the reachability has been propagated to us. Then here, Swisscom uh, customers from a traffic point of view try to uh, basically retrying the, the basically to get the reachability from the, from the servers. And here on the bottom, you see the response that nothing coming back from Facebook anymore. We can see how many servers, how many IP addresses on the Facebook sites were affected and on the Swisscom side, how many customers were affected on our side. And what's really critical about this dashboard here is if you know the network dimension, uh, that's enough to query the data from all the different uh, angles. So from a device, from a forwarding plane, and from a control plane angle. In this case, the only thing we needed to know is the BGP AS number of Facebook. And with that, basically, we have a perfect view uh, what's going on uh, with Facebook in context of Swisscom. And that's also what uh, um, Marco showed us before uh, with, uh, with network anomaly detection. We said in the beginning that uh, um, basically the whole network analytics, network telemetry is still evolving and therefore we need to cooperate with ITF, the standardization body, where the innovations are happening, but also with other operators, vendors, and especially also with universities. These are the companies which we are currently working very closely together. You will see there are analytics companies, there are uh, network operators, vendors, and also universities across Europe. And one of the projects which we are currently working on uh, is basically to uh, close the gap between uh, message broker, data mesh, and networks. So now, basically, the, the semantics of the network are being described in Yang, and here I have one question to the audience. Who does know in the audience NetConf Yang? Anybody? Okay, we have one. So uh, NetConf is basically, and also ResConf, is the API of the network configuration. So in the past, basically networks were configured through CLI, and CLI are not made for software while Yang is a data modeling language. And this was being invented, similar as before to SNMP, to actually have the configuration and the operational metrics from a device modeled on the one data tree. So basically, if I disable an interface, I can see within the same data tree that the interface is actually being disabled. So we are getting basically a very concise view of the relationship between configuration and operational uh, metrics in the network. But unfortunately, big data is not network today. So the, the data modeling languages in big data are, for instance, Avro, Protobuf, or a JSON schema. And with this initiative, which we are doing with uh, other engineers from, uh, from, from different operators and vendors and uh, analytic providers and universities together, we are actually bringing Yang and Seabor, which is basically the binary encoding of Yang, into uh, the, the message broker. So at the end, uh, we are ending up basically like a cycle. We have NetConf, which is actually pushing the configuration into the network, and we have Yang Push, which are actually uh, delivering us the operational network, uh, the metrics from the network. And at the end, it's basically just, uh, we are syncing two databases between the network and big, big data. And with that, we are actually establishing a very important fundament for closed loop operation or for autonomous driving networks. In detail, uh, in this diagram basically describes that Yang Push has the capability of having the, the, the semantic reference to the JSON message, 
while NetConf has the capability to actually obtain the Young schema from the network. And with the data collection, we can actually register the semantics into the so-called schema registry of a message broker. And then when the message is being forwarded through the message broker to the, 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 the message broker consumer, to the Kafka client, uh, we can actually obtain uh, the, 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 the schema again from the schema registry and then create the database table and have exact semantics uh, from the network. On another project, which we now worked several years, is to bring visibility into the BGP control plane. BGP is basically how we are routing uh, the, the, the packets in the internet, but also in the large data centers and in and the cloud. And BMP, the BGP monitoring protocol, started initially by covering the so-called adjacency RIP. So the RIP is basically a database in a router. We have them twice, once in BGP, and the other one is uh, consequently when we are actually forwarding the packets, uh, this BGP RIP database is then uh, installed into the RIP and from there into the FIP indirectly into the forwarding of the ASICs. And with BMP, we are covering the RIPs. First, uh, what we learn from the peer with the adjacency RIP, and then we moved on to the so-called local RIP, how we install the reachability, and with the adjacency RIP on how we are advertising the, the reachability to other peers. Now we are at the point at ITF where um, we, we are besides the having the, the, the visibility of the RIP and also having the peer in context, we also want to have context how those paths are being installed into the RIP. So are they active, are they passive, are we actually doing equal cost multipathing uh, and also through which route policies uh, these paths have been uh, uh, permitted, dropped or being changed and if changed, what attributes have been changed. So with that, we can get a complete view of, over the BGP control plane and finally understand basically which paths are being installed, how uh, and why uh, in the BGP control plane. Another aspect is, uh, I mentioned initially about IP fix. So IP fix is the so-called debugger, basically similar as BMP to BGP, in this case, in, to the IP forwarding. Um, it has been standardized around early 2004. And now, basically, we are extending IP fix to cover also the so-called segment routing dimensions. We did that in 2021 for uh, MPLS segment routing in RFC 9160, and now we are actually working on uh, to bring also visibility into the SRV6 data plane, and that means specifically that we want to understand when packets are being forwarded into an SRV6 segment routing domain, that we want to understand which segment list is being used and what endpoint behavior has been used to forward to. So the segment list is basically nothing else that you can at the source define how the packet is being forwarded in a segment routing network. And with the segment list, we can understand at which point of the list, uh, at which point of the instruction, uh, the forwarding is currently happening on which device. While the endpoint behavior instructs basically IPv6, how the packet needs to be treated, uh, which routing header should be popped or, uh, sh or sh should be changed. And last but not least, it's not only about dropping packets. We also get, want to get visibility into uh, uh, how much packets are being delayed. And especially wanna, we want to get dimensions on those delays. So we want to understand where the packet delay is happening, on which next hops, on which interfaces and so on. And that is the uh, addition we are uh, doing on the on-path delay in uh, IP fix. Maybe Marco. <laughs> there was some miscommunication. I didn't know this was my ah, part. Ah, so. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we, as we said, we collaborate a lot with uh, with university, and we did some uh, master's uh, thesis projects. So here you can find some. The first one was uh, last year about load distribution inside the data collection. So as you can imagine, 25 million uh, metrics you don't collect with one server alone. Um, the other one was still with ETH um, about visualizing a network. And uh, we have many other projects, uh, but the other point is that uh, we really go to ITF, what we say here, we tried really to standardize what we're doing. Uh, so here you find all the group, uh, all the uh, drafts and RFCs that we, that we have. And uh, do you have any questions? That's actually a very good question. So uh, at ITF, if you're proposing new standards, it's actually common that uh, ITF not only wants a paper, they also want running code. And since uh, we said in the beginning, we are very much like uh, in the beginning of this network analytics, network telemetry lifecycle. So we understood very on if we want to change the industry, uh, then we also need to propose standards. And then with the same thing, we also need to write running code. And actually, uh, when you start with that, you actually continue also. So basically, all the developments we are doing is uh, open sourced. So for instance, the, before I showed a bit into Yang, the UDP Notif library, for instance, is open source. The entire network telemetry data collection is open sourced and we are going to open source also the network anomaly detection soon. And that's the way how we can actually work also with uh, universities together because uh, uh, in, we saw before two uh, theses. These were all basically contributions to this open source project. Sure. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Concerns. Yes, exactly. And <clears throat> you said the threshold as 50%. Is why exactly 50%? Is that already a bit too late? Or should you? So, of course, this uh, anomaly detection still needs a bit of work. At the moment, uh, it's uh, a value that we tried and seems to be working. Uh, but, you know, some addition are required. Um, basically, the whole goal, though, is we have multiple concerns, and somehow, somewhat, you want to have one final score. So the idea is that you can weight the scores in different ways to create the final score so that it's, you know, it can be set at 50%, the threshold 40, 30, doesn't matter at the end. The important thing is the, is the scoring and how you merge them together. And this is actually uh, something we are trying to do. We are trying to um, classify our clients uh, by analyzing their traffic so that we can use the weighting and we can uh, put the weighting in different ways based on the class of, tra of traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would be an example for such a class? So uh, an example could be either a home user, which has very spiky internet because maybe at you know, uh, 12 you start watching YouTube because you eat and you watch YouTube or Netflix, and uh, uh, an enterprise with a database that constantly push data that's very flat uh, graph, right? Mm -hmm. So this could be two graphs, uh, two, two, two classes. But at the end, the, the idea is that um, we don't have, well, we have class by type of traffic, not by type of class of customer. So it, yeah. Or, or maybe we don't know, another way to say it. So if changes are happening on the network, they don't need to be bad. So for instance, if you have redundancy, 
changes are perfectly fine. So if there are no impact into the forwarding, we are on the safe side. So it's, it's a concern, something changed, but it did not have a negative impact on the forwarding. So therefore, we want to uh, basically visualize there was a change, something uh, might impair the service, but actually it's still okay we are able to forward versus we no longer able to forward. <laughs> yeah, um, so but they have some marketing slides if you want. So, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, you'll probably be around for a little bit. Yes, uh, we will be out here. Discuss, uh, anything you can also approach, uh, yeah. So let me do the marketing stuff very quickly. <laughs> How do you join Swisscom if you now you think it's very attractive and Swisscom is very attractive? I can tell you that. <laughs> Uh, the first way is via an internship, a step-in program. Um, I suggest to take a picture if you're interested. Uh, basically, it's between 40 and 100%. It is between 3 and 12 months, and you can do it while you study or just after your degree, uh, it being bachelor or master. Second is trainee program. This is not really concerning a lot of IT students, but the idea is that you work in two, three projects, 100% for a year, and you move across different projects and you need a master's degree. But the cool thing is that there is the IT trainee program, which is much better because it's for IT people. So now you don't need a master, but you can also work with the bachelor. And it's 60 to 100, still uh, 12 to 18 months, and still with two or three projects. So that's cool if you don't know what to do next. Uh, that could be a good chance to you know, space a bit around in different fields. And lastly, but not least, the junior position is basically when you join the company, you know, uh, you start at any time, it's 50, uh, between 50 and 100%, and you have a permanent contract. So from junior, then you can grow. Yeah. And if you have any question, this is our emails. Please feel free if you want to, to contact us about anything, joining or what we do, or really anything, just, just contact us. Let me add one thing. Like two years ago, we were also uh, standing in front of uh, students at an university, and I've been asked at that point in time, what does a student need to do to be hired at Swisscom in our team? And I started and say, you need to be a data engineer, a system engineer, a network engineer, and a software engineer. And if I look at your faces, I had exactly the same response like, oh, that's really damn hard, okay? Nobody can cover four disciplines at once. And then I said at the end, when we are interviewing the candidate and we are saying that, usually the first response is, hey, I can do a little bit of everything, but my main focus is on these two domains, and these are the right people. So I can encourage you, uh, explore different areas, explore different things, and be open for, for new things. So, good. Thank Thanks. You so much.